Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome to another episode of T for C. If you love history, comedy, and performing in front of an audience, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest spent four years as a correspondent on Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and four years on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno and is currently a correspondent on CBS Sunday Morning, the host of his own podcast entitled Mobituaries, and is a frequent panelist on the hit NPR quiz show Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. But before I introduce you to the one and only Mo Rocca, I want to make sure you've signed up for the one and only Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you a sneak peek inside the episodes and the guests we're going to be featuring that week. And it is super easy to do. Just go to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. And while you're on the homepage, I want to invite you to scroll down where you're going to see a whole bunch of boxes organized by career. So if you're interested in the theater, film and the arts, just click on that box. Or if you're passionate about becoming an author or going into the publishing industry, then click on that box. There are dozens of career options to choose from and hundreds of professional episodes to binge on. Now, my friends, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my wonderful next guest is Mo Rocca, a correspondent for the TV magazine show CBS Sunday Morning and host of the podcast Mobituaries, which starts its second season in November 2019. He's also the host of the CBS Saturday morning show, The Henry Ford's Innovation Nation, and a frequent panelist on NPR's hit weekly quiz show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Mo created and hosted the cooking channels, My Grandmother's Ravioli, in which he learned to cook from grandmothers and grandfathers all over the U.S. Mo spent four seasons as a correspondent on Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and four seasons as a correspondent on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. On Broadway, he played Vice Principal Panch in the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, and other stage credits include Duty in the South Asian, Southeast Asian <laughs> Tour of Greece. I'm sorry, I got me a little choked up there. Okay, Morocco <laughs> began his career in TV as a writer and producer for the Emmy and Peabody Award-winning PBS children's series Wishbone. Mo is also the author of a brand new book published in November 2019 entitled Mobituaries, Great Lives Worth Reliving. Mo, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you <laughs> caffeinated and ready to go? I am ready to go, and I feel like I wore you out with all that stuff. Off, you did. I'm excited. <laughs> you did wear me out. You have way too many accomplishments. And I didn't even mention the Emmy Award that you won for, was it the 2010 Tony Awards? It was. Yeah. I won an Emmy for writing for the Tonys, which is kind of a cheat. I'm sort of halfway towards an EGOT. Now, if I can just win a Grammy for singing about the Oscars, I will have gotten there with two gigs. <laughs> Great. Well, it is so wonderful to have you on the show. And we are going to be focusing here in terms of the career for our young listeners, yes. journalism mixed in with comedy. So how do you take mm -hmm. your love of comedy, your love of telling stories and maybe even learning in the process and turn it into a career in journalism? The first espresso shot is what entry-level jobs, Mo, are available to young people who want to break into that field? Well, on both sides, the entry-level job, and it's it's going to sound rather generic, I think it, it is either interning or, if you're lucky, jumping right to a production assistant job. But I feel like what one does with those positions, right, is 
is the key. And I think it's tricky. I think that in both comedy and in journalism, people, like in many professions, are working, working very hard, the people that are there full time. And it's sort of incumbent on the intern and the production assistant to throw herself and himself into whatever task might be available, whatever you see around you. I remember when I was at The Daily Show with Jon Stewart that it was those production assistants and interns who would work their ways their way into the edit rooms just to watch and observe our great editors on the Avid machines. At least that's what they were using then. I think they may still be using them. I don't know. I feel like it's sort of like being a pig looking for truffles. <laughs> it's sort of like going and, and digging around and finding where there might be something rather than than waiting for a specific task to be assigned. Yeah. So you want to be proactive. You want to ask for additional assignments. You want to use whatever extra time you might have to learn from those who are there with more experience? I think so. I think that people can tell. I mean, that's the biggest thing. And, and forgive me if I'm jumping ahead and, you'll, and stop me if I am, is you can sense when someone is really engaged. You can just sense it. It's like it's like dating. You want to be with somebody who makes you feel like you're the only person in the world. And when I see young employees who look at the assignment at the job at the job in that same way that's inspiring and i want to i want to continue working with that person regardless of that person's background certainly or even skill set just that sense of engagement like i want to be here and you can tell you can tell yeah, this isn't nine to five. And I'm glad you stopped yourself back there because I thought we were going to move into a Me Too moment there. Oh, God. <laughs> Where you no, were no. talking about the interns <laughs> looking at you like you no, were the only one uh, in no. the world, right? <laughs> no, ha- hashtag Motu. No, sorry. No, ab- ab- absolutely not. No, I mean, I, and I realize I have to be careful there. But no, you, you can tell when this is really the focus. And I always feel like, you know, just... Even fake it if you need to. <laughs> make make the people you're working for feel like this is the only job that's on your radar. You may be thinking about what's next. That's natural. But you're really primarily thinking about this job. Absolutely. So what is a useful skill or skills, Mo, that you have looked for over the years in the young people that you've hired? Engagement, but also constantly coming up with ideas. Now, I know that too many ideas sometimes can be a distraction, maybe. You know, once you're on a project and a direction is set, then you sort of need all hands on deck. But I look for someone when when there are those openings, when I say we need an idea for how to end this podcast episode, or I'm looking for an opening moment. Opening moments and closing moments, I think, are hard whenever you're telling stories and they're crucial. But how should we open this? And if a young person says, what about this? What about that? What about this? And comes up with a few ideas. I find that really exciting and inspiring. I think it's, you know, you have to pivot a word that's overused today. And once once the boss says, here's the direction we're moving, then, OK, now we're set on that path. But I look for somebody who takes advantage of those openings, those moments when it is sort of an open call for ideas and jumps in there. It's dispiriting, I think, if a young person doesn't leap at that because there are not that many openings. There are not that many open calls for ideas. And so does that make sense? I kind of want somebody who's going to jump right in there. Yeah, absolutely. I think another way that I might put it, tell me if this jives Please. with what you're thinking, is you're looking for people who are creative. I'm looking for people who are creative and excited about being creative. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. You don't want them just kind of sitting around being passive, listening, listening, but not giving back. Exactly. And I realize that that takes a certain amount of confidence and courage. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I oftentimes see myself and as a nervous undergrad in a section discussion and a breakaway discussion after a big lecture, afraid to put forth an idea. So I understand that. And I, and that's not a, a character flaw. I mean, that's just human nature, but boy, I'd, I'd like to see that person bear down and have the confidence to be creative and, and throw out ideas. Yeah. And I think the 
other piece to that is that we don't expect all those ideas to be terrific and it's okay to fall flat on your face. That takes guts. It does take guts. And, you know, I think that's, I mean, that's my biggest concern about social media is the the hashtag fail, all in caps, used as a cudgel. I worry that it's squelching the creative spirit in a lot of people. Listen, you know, joke writers are used to this. Joke writers write 100 jokes and the host will use one. That's just part of the game. It's not because the joke writer isn't doing a good job. The joke writer, the joke writer is doing a great job if she or he comes up with 100 different jokes and, and one of them ends up making air. So that's what I also look for is a kind of resilience and understanding that 99 jokes that don't work – followed by one that works, is not a failure. It's a success. Amen. Absolutely. So what about life experiences? What in your experience, Mo, as somebody who performed and led Hasty Pudding when you were at Harvard, do Uh you think are the most useful ones for someone to have starting out in this field? Well, I think there are two different things. I think... um, Number one is writing. I mean, I think a fancy education does not guarantee that you're going to be a terrific writer. And a quote unquote, you know, sort of unfancy education, it has no bearing later on on your ability to write. The only thing that's going to make you a good writer is practice. And it it's it's so helpful for pitching ideas and then obviously for executing them, especially when you're telling stories, is the practice of writing and just how to tell a story. And we're all hardwired human beings to appreciate a story well told. We all want to hear a good story, whether it's in three minutes, like I did on The Daily Show, eight minutes, like I do on CBS Sunday Morning, or 45 minutes, like I do on this podcast. The same skill sets come into it. But in terms of preparing yourself to to tell good stories, the life experience, I think it's about allowing yourself to follow your interest. There's an old-fashioned term, I guess a yen for something, and I'll put it in, in concrete terms here. When I was in my mid to late 20s, I became interested in oddball historic sites. I become interested in presidential history, but then I sort of t- said to myself, who actually is working at the historic sites for the presidents you can't remember were actually president? All those names we've forgotten between Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt. They've got a lot of facial hair. A bunch of them are from Ohio. And I bought a one-way plane ticket on US Air. It was a good deal to Indianapolis, rented a car, and drove around to a bunch of these homes and met the docents, the tour guides that worked in these oddball historic sites. And I learned their stories. I wrote them down. I submitted them as magazine articles. I had no plan. I, I wasn't. No one was paying me to do this. And eventually, when I met a man at the Warren G. Harding House in Marion, Ohio, who dressed up as First Lady Florence Harding to give tours of the house, and it wasn't like a shticky drag queen act. He was really, really good at being Florence Harding. That led me to The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. That's how I was hired. I took that story and I pitched it. This was not a grand plan. I think the moral of the story for me, the big takeaway for me was I had this interest, this itch I wanted to scratch. I was young. I was able to do it. You know, I I didn't have a family. I could just sort of take off and do this. And I think it led me to a good place because I had this this interest, this curiosity, and I indulged it. And I think that's so important. If something is interesting to you and you explore it, it will end up being interesting to other people. It's infectious. I love that story, Mo, for so many reasons. And I think one of the main ones being that you didn't try to reverse engineer it. You just went. You just went and you decided... I'm curious about this. I want to learn more about this. And then the way revealed itself to you, right? You got story ideas. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it was a curiosity that was mine. I was going to say uniquely mine. I'm sure there maybe there are other people that have been, I'm sure there are that have been curious about this, but 
it felt uniquely mine. I didn't go and crowdsource it. I didn't find it on the internet. I didn't float out. I didn't put out on Twitter there. Is anyone else interested in the home of Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis? Is anyone else interested in the James Garfield estate in Menor, Ohio? I didn't do that. I was interested in it. That's what mattered. And I went and I did it. And I interviewed all these people, many of them volunteers, wonderful people who keep these historic sites alive. And I think my interest and my passion for it brought me to a good place. And I think it's really, really important. And it is, by the way, as a child and as a young person, not to be embarrassed about what you're interested in, because it's what makes you you and what will make you valuable in the workplace when people hire you and say, oh, my God. God, look how she lights up about, you know, Tunisian pottery. We didn't expect that we were going to do a story about Tunisian pottery, but now we must do a story about Tunisian poverty because Sheila is so excited about it. <laughs> yes. What were your interests when you were in high school? Um, well, um, in high school, gosh, I loved musicals. I did a, I did a, the theater and at my high school theater really wasn't the emphasis wasn't placed on it. People weren't it was, I, my school and I loved my high school, but it was very jock centered. So in a sense, I had to own that. I had to say, you know what? I want to do theater. Our theater program isn't great, but I'm also going to do theater outside of school and it will require of work. It'll require me getting on the metro in D.C. and going to a community theater. And yeah, so that was my that was my primary interest. And I became interested in history later because I grew up in Washington, D.C., a place rich in history. But because it was there, I took it for granted. And then I moved to the suburbs of Dallas to a town called Plano. Wonderful people, not a real sense of history. If something was pre-1975, it was like a historic monument. Everything had been paved over, and I suddenly missed what I had and, and had not really appreciated before. And so because I was living in a place that architecturally was very soulless, I said to myself, when I get back east – I'm going to read every historic marker I pass by. I'm going to make an effort to really find out where I am and who lived and died before me in the place where I'm living. And that made me feel rooted and grounded. And so it was an experience of being in a very cold place that, you know, emotionally cold place because Texas is hot <laughs> um, that nurtured this interest. Gotcha. No, what a that's a really important point to make for our listeners that even when you're in a place that you may not love, it can help you appreciate things that you might have had before. I think that's right. Yeah. So what about someone's major? Is it a deciding factor to get into the world of journalism and comedy? The short answer is no, I don't think it is. Um, but I do think that majoring in something that you're that you're interested in, even if it doesn't have an obvious application, will help you in journalism and comedy because it will make you an expert in something you care about and give you a unique point of view. So I do think that if you major in religion, well, there's there's which is a great major to have and an important one in the world, and there are no obvious job applications, I think, with a major in religion. But boy, at a at a comedy show, at a place that's dealing in current events, I mean, religion is a, is a major deciding factor in world events. So they're right there. It's, it's going to help you. If you're writing for a comedy show, I'm thinking, and do you have an, a major in engineer? I mean, the engineering of a joke, I guess my it matters. I mean, I guess my point is, is better to go with a thing that's going to excite and animate you because in a creative field, it will find a role. It really will. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of rattling through all the different concentrations at Harvard. We called them concentrations, but rattling through them all and thinking every one of them would have been valuable in a writer's room <laughs> when you're in a, a, working on a comedy show about current events, government, African-American studies, uh, pre-med. They're all going to come up in different ways. And at a more traditional news show like CBS Sunday Morning, which is a news variety show. You want a variety of, of points of view. I hope that doesn't seem like I'm dodging the question. I really believe that. You're not at all. And I 
agree with you because I think the important skills that you need, certainly in journalism, is being able to write, being able to distill complex information into manageable uh, sentences and concepts and being able to communicate. So I think as well, many of those skills are relevant to comedy. I think so. And um, it's funny, I keep thinking about this word engagement even more than communicate, because I think I think there's a direct connection between the engagement of the person doing the writing, you know, the engagement with that topic and the engagement with the audience. So, mm-hmm. Yes, I, I think that's also true. What about a graduate school degree? And this is less so for those folks who are trying to get their foot in the door and mo- more so, I was about to say more so, more so for somebody <laughs> who wants to make it up to the top of the heap. Is it important to have a grad school degree? And if so, which ones do you think they should get? I don't think it's important to have a graduate school degree. I'm no authority on this, but it it would seem to me that going to law school, for instance, and I know a lot of people who have escaped from the law, and I mean from the career in law, that is, that the language, the specificity, the dissection of language is certainly great is important for writing jokes and for communicating in a news piece. So I can see how in a roundabout way that could be useful. But um, I I don't I don't see that as a requirement. I don't think it's a bad thing. I, w- I wouldn't fault somebody for it. But I, if I'm to be almost crude about it in terms of time management, I would think that after getting an undergraduate degree in either comedy or in broadcast journalism, it would be better to try to work in the field right away. Yeah. Get your experience on the job. I think so. So, Mo, what is the best part for you of being in this profession? I love the performative part of it. I began in musical theater, as you mentioned. I was duty in the Southeast Asian tour of the musical Grease, standing room only in Jakarta. People are still talking about it 25 years. I'm kidding. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but I believe that – and there are people in the field of journalism that would find what I'm about to say sacrilege. But I think that journalism and entertainment are not enemies. I think an interview – is a scene. It's um I look at myself as a journalist, as an interviewer, as, you know, ideally best supporting actor in this scene. Not a co-star, absolutely not. But I think that there is a performative aspect to it that's very important. It's real, like the best kind of acting. There's a <laughs> there is truth in it, right? We're not playing, we're not pretending to be other people. And if if I'm doing my job, the person I'm interviewing is definitely not pretending to be somebody else. You know, you are performing for an audience. You want an audience to remain engaged. And I love that part of it. So I find that when I do a piece for CBS Sunday Morning or when I'm doing my podcast, I'm working more of the same muscles that I worked on The Daily Show than someone might think. So I, I love the performance part of it. I, I love being, look, I love being on a stage. Yeah, the adrenaline is pumping. Yeah, and again, it's not about stealing focus. I'm not saying that. It's, you know, if you want to reduce it to, to a, a math equation, again, it's, you're in as the reporter, the minor role, but you do have a relationship to the interviewee. And you have to figure out what relationship is going to be the best to get the most out of the interviewee. Well, and I think what you do so well, and I've watched a whole variety of the interviews that you've done, is that you are very authentic when you're sitting across from the people that you're interviewing. You are, it's not like you're pretending to be someone other than who you are. Right. Well, I appreciate that. That's certainly what I try to do. And as we know, Mo, every job out there, and you have multiple jobs, has aspects of it that we don't always love. So what is the part of your current job slash jobs that suck the most? I think the suckiest part 
is when you come back after an interview and you have hours and hours of material that has to be winnowed down, that has to be distilled into a story that's engaging and digestible. And I think this really separates the... A-listers from the B-listers. I don't mean to be – this to sound harsh about it. But it's – if you interview someone for three hours and I have a colleague and she's known for doing very long interviews and she's not coincidentally – one of the best in the whole business. I mean, I Martha Teichner, I just I admire her so much. And there is a reason she goes that long is you have to go that long a lot of the time to get that bite, that piece that's going to make the difference that's that takes it from 95 to 100 percent. Then the part that's really hard and makes my head hurt, and thank God I work with fantastic producers, and I, that it's it's very rare that it falls mostly on me. This part of the job is how to work your way through that material and not just make really easy choices, not just say take the three hour interview and just say, all right, the first five minutes is going to be the piece to really work through what you've got <laughs> and 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 build that puzzle, find the, the pieces that work and how they're going to fit together. That part makes my head hurt. I've all, I've all, For years, Andrea, I've been looking for the right metaphor for this. It, it's sort of like putting your head through a funnel or something <laughs> and trying to like, it hurts, it hurts. Or like putting like slabs of concrete in your blender and trying to turn it into a smoothie. I'm not sure what the metaphor is, but it hurts. But it's the only way to get to a great piece rather than a good piece. That is great advice and just great insight into the industry. And if it means that it's Tuesday night and it's 11 p.m. and you're in the office and you think, I'm not really making much progress, you actually are making progress because you're there on a Tuesday night at 11 p.m. trying to make it work. You've, you're already on your way. <laughs> And how often has that happened? Well, it happens. I've tried it at this point because I'm 50 and I'm trying for it to happen less and less. But, you know, I'll tell you, if you do that in your 20s, if you really do it in your 20s, you're much less likely going to have to do it three nights a week in your 50s. Mm. And that's a big that's that's. A real lesson, I think. People I know in different fields who really toughed it out in their 20s, they avoided a lot of pain later on. I'm not saying it's a, it's it's guaranteed. You may switch careers and that may be the thing you should do. Maybe you should switch careers in your 30s and 40s and you're kind of starting over and that can be very exciting. But boy, if you tough it out in your 20s, you'll guarantee as much as you can that it doesn't hurt as much in your 40s and 50s. Is that because you've moved higher up the food chain? I think so, but also because you've built those muscles. And so it's not just about, oh, getting it done and then then coasting later. No, you're never going to coast and you shouldn't want to coast. And I'm sorry that I'm putting this all in the context of pain, but, <laughs> but, um, but <laughs> let me put it in more positive terms. You will have a much more exciting career if you throw yourself in when you're younger. I have to say, though, Mo, I think it is important to talk about the the grunge work or some of the heavy lifting because right. there is, I think, a misimpression among some people that being in television and comedy and The Daily Show, all of that is just glamorous and l laughter from morning until night. And you don't appreciate just how difficult it is. Uh, Andrea, let me talk about that because it's really, really important that people understand that being a comedy writer, and I was a, a correspondent on The Daily Show, which was a great job. Um, and I certainly did a lot of writing. We all did. But the actual writing staff, the people who helped Jon Stewart put together his material each night, they were all and they remain, I'm sure, at the current version of the show, very fine talents, but they worked hard. It is not – and I adore Tina Fey and 30 Rock, and that was a comedy about a writer's room, but – 
Tina Fey would be the first to tell you that's not what it's like to be a comedy writer. To be a comedy writer, I know this is going to sound weird, they quite literally would sweat. I mean, so they were working under the gun to produce material, reams of material. And for a current events-based show where the cycles are moving even more quickly, jokes written by noon were obsolete by 2 p.m. And so it was just more and more right up to the minute. There wasn't a lot of chit-chat. And so I meet young people who have great senses of humor and have a lot of promise, and they – the important thing is to combine that talent, that raw talent, with a really strong work ethic. It's it's a very hard work. It's centered around the host, and so it's every work environment is going to be a little bit different. What works best for the host and how the material is delivered to him or her. And there, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here. The writers work, you know, behind closed doors alone, solo. I mean, it's solitary work, and they're expected to come up with a lot of material, and then they get together towards the end of the day to cull it and review it. But it's not sort of people, um, you know, with Nerf basketballs, throwing them into hoops and sort of saying, oh, gosh, let's let's just chit chat and figure out what strikes us as funny. I mean, there's a little bit of that. You need that. But otherwise, it's bearing down. Wow. And I think that's I think it's really important to remember. It's funny. I heard I won't name him a dearly departed great broadcast journalist who I used to hear worked so hard. This is going to sound terrible, but he worked so hard that you could smell him. He smelled bad by the end of the day because he was sweating so hard. He was working so hard. And I would see that also at The Daily Show with comedy writers. Wow. My olfactory nerves are tingling right now. (laughs) Thank you for that insight. So, Mo, what is the best career advice you've ever gotten? One of the best pieces of advice I ever received was from a friend of mine, a screenwriter and playwright named Jonathan Tolins. And years ago, he was um, working in Hollywood, I think doing a lot of script rewrites, which is a common job that screenwriters have. But he was also writing plays on the side. And he said to me, it's so important, especially in television and in film and in very collaborative mediums, to have something that's all your own, something that that's just you. There's no executive that's going to come and say, change this or make that 15 percent funnier or, you know, switch the character out or set it in Polynesia instead of, you know, in South Africa. Like and I think the fundamental lesson there was if you have something that's creatively yours, that will nourish you. And then while you're while you're living on the on the other side in a job where you have a boss and you have network you know requirements that say make it this way or that way that you may not be thrilled about you'll be okay because both sides will be fulfilled and i should point out that his he's a highly regarded playwright his play buyer and seller uh, a couple of years ago on off broadway was a big hit and i think there's probably a lesson in that by 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 keeping both halves of himself well fed nourished I think he has been much more successful. Great. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Have something that's yours. And that can kind of feed your soul, even if you're in a job or a career at that point, that may not be. Yeah. So, for instance, let's say you are an aspiring comedy writer and you get hired by a financial news network to write for a host there. That's not exactly what you want to be doing, right? And you may try, and maybe the host will appreciate and say, oh, wow, this copy is – there's a couple of little zingers in here, and that's kind of fun. But you know what? This is a financial news network. Uh, a zinger once an hour is okay, not every five minutes. Well, then on the side, what you should be doing is working on 
your stand-up routine and really and pouring yourself into that or into the comedic screenplay that you really want to be doing. Uh, you should still stay engaged and because I think at, at your financial news network job, because you never know, you never know because that financial news network then may acquire a comedy channel. And then say, well, wait a minute, here's this person that was writing kind of surprisingly interesting, quirky to- uh, copy for our financial news network hosts. And uh, and then you as the writer can say, and look, I've got this pilot for a half hour comedy that would work perfectly on the network you just acquired. So things have a way of working themselves out if you're both engaging with what you're doing and on the side cultivating what you really want to be doing. Terrific. Mo, what about movies or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows, or for that matter, books that you think accurately depict your profession? Are there any out there? It's a tough question because my profession has is it's hard for me to even define exactly what I do. And I don't mean that in a smug way, like I'm indefinable. It's not that. Um, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, there's certainly things that, oh, boy, I'd love to come back to that. The movie network, that's what, that's always relevant. It is relevant. Um, yeah. That's, that's always relevant. Um, I can't offhand think of something that – makes me and you mentioned 30 rock which may not be perfect in its characterization of being a comedy writer which you have been right it certainly uh, has pieces of truth in it i'm sure oh sure absolutely and it's just so well written it's just such a wonderful show that um it's a it's a model for comedy writers i think i'm trying to think of of movies or books that depict what it's like to do what I do. What is that? Oh boy, I wish I could remember. Is it Janet Malcolm, the famous book, the uh, the, the the journalist and the murderer? I think that well, was. I don't pretty, know that one. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> um. I should look. I should look on the computer right now. Okay. Okay. So, journalist Janet Malcolm wrote a great book called The Journalist and the Murderer. It was published back in 1989, and it depicts the relationship, essentially exploitive relationship between an interviewer and an interviewee. Both need something from each other. And that's not that sounds awfully dark, but I think that it's a it's a a dark depiction of how The journalist cultivates the trust and the comfort level, right, and works, you know, to attain a comfort level with the interviewee. But the interviewee is also trying to get his or her story out there through the journalist. So there is a transactional nature to it. And interviewing murderers is not my stock in trade. But I was surprised how seeing it depicted in a totally different kind of news story kind of resonated with me. Nice. Okay, well, we'll make sure to include that in show notes. So final espresso shot, Mo, what would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession? I think since we've been talking about comedy and journalism, I think people would be surprised at the closeness between the two. I have people that come up to me. I'm thinking of one in particular, a a renowned comedian who came up to me not long ago, and this was very flattering. He said, I want to be doing what you're doing. I think both comedians and journalists try to communicate with audiences and tell stories and make people think. And I think that we're living in a day and age where, and I think The Daily Show was certainly part of this, where the two have become blended. As I said before, I mean that that will strike some traditional journalists as a little troublesome. But I think that there's a great there's great promise in that. I think both professions have something to learn from each other about how to how to make audiences think and how to engage them. 
Yes, I think, and we'll get into this more in our main interview, but one of the questions that I have is how do you walk the line between engaging and not misrepresenting or or moving into more of personal commentary versus sharing the facts? Well, that's interesting. I mean, it's a tricky question for me to answer because I'm not put on stories that are more traditional news stories. Like I've, I've never reported from a war zone or done hard news reporting on elections. A lot of the time I'm explaining things. I did a story that was very fulfilling on explaining the Electoral College back in 2012. It was a very gratifying experience. I had people come up to me on the street and say, almost in a confessional tone, thank you so much. I never really understood how it worked before. So there my task is a little bit as kind of a showman, as trying to make a subject that could be very dry and unpalatable much more appetizing. And so um, that may sound, I hope I'm not sidestepping what you're what you're asking there. No, I don't Uh, think so. I think you're saying when you're doing feature stories, it's easier to bring in your sense of humor. Yeah, I think that's right. And also, I mean, you know, life isn't divided into hour long dramas and half hour sitcoms. So, I mean, it's okay if one moment is very, very dark and the next moment is light and fun. Yeah, because that's how people are. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think you fall more into the light and fun category, Mo. I want to thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. Mo's podcast is called Mobituaries. It's super entertaining and interesting. You definitely are going to want to subscribe. It's kind of like history for lazy people. And you're going to want to get his book, Mobituaries, Great Lives Worth Reliving. Mo, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. A lot of fun. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.